Hi everybody. I hope you're all doing well. I hope that you and your families are safe and sound and healthy and home. Can't stress enough right now how one of the most important things that you could do at this point is just simply stay home. Avoid public places, avoid public gathering. So this is my first attempt at uh, remote teaching and one of your first attempts at remote learning for my class. We have to be flexible over these next few weeks, maybe a few months, and we're all just going to do our best. I'm gonna continue teaching and you're gonna continue learning. Right now, obviously, I'm making a YouTube video, but who knows what will happen going forward. Uh, for example, there's a very good chance that we're going to meet collectively for synchronous instruction. We'll be doing that possibly through Google Hangouts Meet or through Zoom, but that's still to be determined. And, you know, that might be a week from now, we'll see. In the meantime, I'm going to continue producing these lessons, posting them onto YouTube, and you'll be able to watch them that way. Uh, feel free to pause. I would definitely recommend having a notebook out as I am going through this video so that you could jot things down, that's important. I'm sitting here in my kitchen, so if you, know, you hear background noise, I, I gotta apologize ahead of time. Uh, the Bowman household is not an, exactly a calm place, so you know, I'm sure you have your own issues at home too. Okay. All right. So I, uh, first of all, I hope all of you have signed up for my Google classroom that you're, uh, have joined it. If not, you could go to Weebly and you could find my join code there. As of now, I think I'm going to be moving from Weebly to Google classroom and that's where I'll be distributing materials. That's where I'll be making announcements. That's where I will be giving assignments. So please stay, uh, stay up to date with that and make sure that you're checking in frequently. Uh, I'm going to also need to find a way to ensure that you're watching videos like this and that you're attending it, you know, our classes if we're having them virtually. I can't stress enough that uh, we're going to continue using Remind. Uh, that is, I guess, the most convenient, the best way for teacher to student correspondence. It's quick and easy, better than email. So, you know, it's even better than contacting me through Google Classroom. So if you have a, just a, a question, you can, you can just shoot me a text through Remind and that's the very best way. All right, so let's talk about today. Uh, first and foremost, in a moment, I'm gonna go over things that you must have for the upcoming weeks. Uh, but for today, you definitely need to have a document. Uh, I posted to Google Classroom a document that, uh, it's a past AP exam actually, and I'm asking you to print it up if possible. I'll talk more about the possibility of printing or, the, or if it's not possible. Uh, and really, you don't have to print up the whole document, you just have to print up the last few pages, pages nine and 10. And those are the ones we're going to be using today. In fact, we're really only just going to be using page nine. Uh, I believe that's the rhetorical analysis passage, but double check that. It, so if you haven't done so yet, please make sure that you go to my Google Classroom, print up that document, have it on hand, and I'll be talking about it shortly, what I want you to do. There will be portions of this video where I ask you to pause and do your own work and then to resume the video. In a way, you're going to be annotating and then uh, we're going to be kind of be comparing notes. So, you know, what we're doing today is we're just going to dissect a rhetorical analysis passage from a past AP exam. It's a pretty good passage, I got to say. Okay, so before I dive straight into the lesson, I need to talk about a few things that you're going to need for the next few weeks. At home, do you have your textbook? On occasion, I'll be giving you a few assignments from the textbook. It's important that you have it at home. Now, if you don't have any of these things because you left them at school, then you, we're going to need to look out for an email or an announcement from the school about when they're going to permit us to go in to get materials. I'm sure that there are a bunch of you like myself who need to get into the school in order to get some things. Do you have your clips book? 
although we are moving away from Cliffs and to the new review book, I will still be giving you some assignments from Cliffs. I know that we're definitely going to be doing multiple choice. We will be doing some essays from there. So please make sure you have Cliffs. And most importantly, really, is your new review book. Do you have that? I'm pretty sure almost all of you got it, but there might be one or two of you who didn't for some strange reason. So if that's the case, you need to contact me today and we need to figure out a way to get that to you. I, I'm, I'm not sure how that's going to happen, but please, that new review book is uh, probably the most important thing that you're going to need right now. Of course, there will be a lot of resources that I'm going to be giving to you just through Google Classroom, but these are the things that we need. So make sure that you have them. So the document that you're going to need for the next few, you know, for the next few lessons is this one. It's a rhetorical analysis passage from 2010, and it's written by Benjamin Banneker. It's really important that you have this in front of you, but if you don't, I'll be talking in a moment about what you could do as an alternative if you don't have a printer. It's not ideal, but it's better than nothing. If you haven't done so already, please print this up. So as you know, annotations are key in this class and it's one of the ways that we interact with the text and dissect it. That's kind of why it's important to have this printed. But if you can't for some reason print it, then I guess the next best thing that you could do is have it on some sort of screen and have next to you a notebook or a sheet of paper. And you're going to kind of take notes in that way. Ideally, you should be writing on this sheet of paper, but you know, that'll have to do. So we have to think about things in terms of the AP exam. So you've got that, pr that document printed and we'll notice that at the top of it, that it says, you should take 40 minutes to do the full essay. Now keep in mind, that's reading, annotating, planning, and writing the essay. So although this is practice, we, wanna, we want to approach this with that in mind, because if we take too long to do either the reading or the annotating or the planning or the actual writing, at this point, we're actually putting ourselves at a disadvantage. Uh, side note, let me just talk about the AP exam. Who knows, right? Who knows? Who knows if you're going to be taking it, if you're going to be taking it at a later date, if you're going to be taking it at home somehow. We don't know yet. This is all up in the air. Everything is up in the air. So uh, again, we got to be flexible and just do our best. My wife, Dr. Bowman, is making my daughter. Anna, some mac and cheese for lunch right now. So if you hear anything in the background, it's the sound of mac and cheese being made. Craft mac and cheese, of course. So let's talk about time. In a few moments, I'm going to tell you to pause this video and to just get to work at reading and annotating the document. It's important that you do this because if you decide to just continue into the video, then you're kind of missing out on the whole educational experience right now. And so when I say pause, you pause, and then what you're gonna do is hopefully find a secluded and quiet space and give yourself around 10 minutes to read the document and annotate the living heck out of it. Uh, I'll be reading the directions out loud in a moment as far as what they're asking you to do. We want to keep that in mind as we're reading. But you, when I say annotate, you know what to do, right? This is what we have been training to do. This is what we've been doing the whole time. We're thinking of rhetorical strategies. And what does that boil down to? What is the author doing? Okay. What is the purpose? What is the goal? And how is he or she, in this case, he, doing it? What are the strategies, the techniques, the devices in order to achieve that goal? And in this case, it's very specific what the author, Benjamin Banneker, is doing. 
It's even very specific about who he's writing to, and that should all come into play in your annotations. So keep that in mind. Uh, let's just switch to a desktop angle, and I'll read the directions to you. Uh, we'll read them together, and you should be underlining as you read the directions. Always, whenever you get to the directions of any of these AP language tasks, make sure your pen is in hand. You're not allowed to use a highlighter on the day of the test, so make sure your pen is in, in hand. And, oh, by the way, no more pencils from this point on. I saw that some of you for your athletes uh, are athletes overpaid essay. You were using pencils. Stop that. Can't do it anymore. No more pencils. Pen only. And that's because they don't let you use pencils on the AP exam. So the directions say, Benjamin Banneker, the son of former slaves, was a farmer, astronomer, mathematician, surveyor, and an author. A surveyor. That's somebody who looks at land and basically measures land. George Washington was a surveyor also. In 1791, he wrote to Thomas Jefferson, framer of the Declaration of Independence and Secretary of State to President George Washington. Read the following excerpt from the letter and write an essay that analyzes how Banneker uses rhetorical strategies to argue against slavery. Okay, so really quick. First of all, obviously we're underlining this part. And what's really nice of them is that they're telling us already what he's arguing. So this should probably be in our thesis statement in one way or the other. Uh, a lot of the time on an AP rhetorical analysis passage, they're not going to necessarily tell us what the author is arguing or what their intention is. So the fact that they give us that is not only helpful, but it's also a hint, hey, this is what we're focusing on. And of course, obviously, rhetorical strategies will be looking for those. All right, now just as a side note, I have in the past seen so many students say that Benjamin Banneker in this letter is writing to Thomas Jefferson and President George Washington. That's inaccurate, and that is a mistake of the reader here. Uh, it's, he's just writing to Thomas Jefferson. He, Thomas Jefferson was the Secretary of State to President George Washington. So now's the time where you're going to get going. All right, again, find a quiet place, 10 minutes, read this, annotate the living heck out of it. Now, if you're you know, stressed out about, wait, what devices? First of all, what is he doing? Don't stress out about the devices. It's more about can you explain what's he doing in each particular paragraph and how is he doing it? So what is he saying? What is he trying to get through? And what are the strategies that he's using in order to get through? Uh, remember, it's not so much about naming devices. If you can, that's fantastic. But this is more just about explication, analysis, exposing what an author is doing when he's taking part in his craft. Or she. Or she. In this case, it's he. Thanks, Dr. Bowman. All right, so in just a few moments, I'm gonna say pause. You're gonna pause the video, seclude yourself, and get going. Give yourself about 10 minutes. I should see this passage full of notes when you get back. And yep, you can even have stuff written down here. That, that white space is an invitation for you to write. Ready? Here we go. Good luck. Pause. So today, these are the expectations. You are first going to read and annotate the Banneker passage, which you should have done already. Hopefully it's full of notes and we're going to be comparing our notes soon. Then you're going to add some annotations and you should probably have a notebook on hand. Uh, you'll add annotations according to mine and according to my think aloud as we kind of go over the passage. I'm gonna, going to also want you to plan the actual essay. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. I want you to also compose the thesis for this essay. And eventually, you know, whether you do this today or tomorrow, you're gonna to give yourself 40 minutes. You have to time yourself, it's a timed writing, and then you're just gonna write the essay. And I'll talk more about that later too. Uh, if you hear voices in the background, that's my wife. She's having a, an online meeting too. So, okay. and. Yeah. <sighs>
Here's Cassiopeia. All right, so by now you should have annotated the passage. In a moment, we are going to go through the passage together. I'm going to share my annotations with you and my thoughts with you. And we have to keep in mind that this is kind of like practice, all right? Uh, obviously, if it were the day of the test, we wouldn't have time to talk about this kind of stuff. We wouldn't be comparing notes, nothing like that, right? So, you know, we eventually we're condensing what you did by yourself and what I did and that we're doing together into just a really short amount of time. And, you know, you just, you, you're rushing, you're doing your best, but you're, you're grappling onto anything that you can when it comes to these passages. So keep that in mind. Anything is fair game. No matter what the goal is to expose how the author is getting through to the reader. Okay, so let's go through this pretty much paragraph by paragraph. And when you're doing your rhetorical analysis essay with regards to organization, that's usually the way you're going to move through the, the passage. Your analysis, for the most part, is going to go paragraph by paragraph. It's chronological and that makes the most sense. All right, so uh, keep in mind, Banneker was the son of former slaves and he's writing to one of the founding fathers of our nation, right? Notice, I'm sure you noticed that he uses the word sir multiple times. I'm not sure exactly how many times, but that's got to be important. So I, I circled the word sir, right? And uh, he says, suffer me to recall to your mind that time in which the arms and tyranny of the British crown were exerted with every powerful effort in order to reduce you to a state of servitude. All right, so over here, you can see in my annotations, I'm saying that servitude is being compared to slavery. It's, it's an analogy, actually. So there's a potential device right there, right? And he's comparing the uh, British colonial rule to, uh, to the, the way the colonies were ruled by the British to the way slaves are ruled by the whites of the nation. All right. Uh, and I also noticed that in this portion, he's talking about time time back back then, then. And then he moves into time of the present, like now. He even uses the word present freedom over here. Present freedom and tranquility. Okay, so skipping down a little bit, uh, he says, uh, but led to a serious and grateful sense of your miraculous and providential preservation. You cannot but acknowledge that the present freedom and tra tranquility which you enjoy, which you enjoy, you have mercifully, mercifully received, and that it is the peculiar blessing of heaven, okay? So over here in my annotations, I wrote down that freedom, it's a gift from heaven. It's like God's gift. He's indirectly stating that to resist slavery is, in a way, to do God's work. So he starts the next paragraph off with the word sir. Uh, and he uses the word sir again in that paragraph. And then he starts the following paragraph off with the word sir. So obviously I just write down sir, okay? I don't know, just whatever. It doesn't matter what I'm annotating. It's just that I'm interacting with the text. So he says, this ter sir was a time in which you clearly saw into the injustice of the state of slavery, in which you had just apprehensions of the horrors of its condition. It was now, sir, that your abhorrence thereof was so excited that you publicly held forth this true and valuable doctrine, which is worthy to be recorded and remembered in all succeeding ages. And here he uses a quote. Okay, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator. I circled the word creator because he was already talking about heaven earlier. Okay, so we'll talk more about that later. Also, I'm sure you noticed the biblical allusion toward the end there. So we could throw this into our essay some here, some, somehow. Okay, and so basically my annotations here is just like I circled sir and I circled the fact that and I underlined the fact that he's using a, uh, a quote and uh, you might need to check my American history here, but are those Thomas Jefferson's? Are those TJ's own words? Are they? Hmm, that's interesting. Here, sir, was a time in which your tender feelings for yourselves had engaged you thus to declare. You were then impressed with proper ideas of the great 
pardon me as I make adjustments here. Ay, ay, ay. Let me pause. Of the great valuation of liberty and the free possession of those blessings to which you were entitled by nature. But, sir, how pitiable it is to reflect that although you were so fully convinced of the benevolence of the Father of mankind and of his equal and impartial distribution of these rights and privileges which he had conferred upon them, that you should at the same time counteract his mercies in detaining by fraud and violence so numerous a part of my brethren under groaning captivity and cruel oppression, that you should at the same time be found guilty of that most criminal act which you professedly detested in others with respect to yourselves. That's deep, right? Okay, first of all, I'm noticing that uh, I'm circling words here. Valuation, liberty, nature, benevolence, right? Those are all such positive words. And again, he's associating them with the, 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 the values of, of heaven, of the creator, of also of, of the nation, the founding document, right? And then later on, in, in that very same paragraph, he's got words like fraud, violence, cruel, groaning captivity, detested, criminal. And so I'm noticing here a major contrast between positive diction uh, at, when it comes to the ideals of uh, and goals of Jefferson, but very, very, very uh, you know negative diction when it comes to the actual actions of you know uh, Jefferson or of the founding fathers or of the nation as a whole, right? So I wrote over here, uh, this is very strong. You know, you wanted freedom for yourself, but you deny it for my brothers. Okay, so again, diction here, it's almost as if we have antithetical concepts, right? You, you were, you were going to say that, obviously, right? And there's some sort of antithesis going on here. Uh, it's almost contradictory. It's almost, um, it's almost as if Jefferson is a What's that word? Where you, he's a hip, 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 hip. Yes, you know it, like he's a hypocrite. Okay. Sir, I suppose that your knowledge of the situation of my brethren is too extensive to need a recital here. It's like, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know the whole situation of what my brothers are going through when it comes to slavery. I don't need to get into it. I'm not gonna waste your time. Neither shall I presume to prescribe methods by which they may be relieved otherwise than by recommend to you and all others to wean yourselves from those narrow prejudices which you have imbibed with respect to them. And as Job proposed to his friends, put your souls in their soul stead. Thus shall your hearts be enlarged with kindness and benevolence towards them, and thus shall you need neither the, the direction of myself or others in what manner to proceed herein. All right, so let me reveal some of this. First of all, I noticed over here that he's using this word wean. And when you wean someone, right, we, we hear that word often when we're talking about uh, babies um, moving away from breastfeeding from their mothers. So they're drinking, right? They're drinking on what? Well, these, these prejudices, right? So it, it's a metaphor, obviously. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Let's reveal some more here, okay? Uh, towards the end here, he's basically saying, look, you could do this. Do what's right, and you won't need my advice. Y you won't need anyone's advice if you just do what's right, and you know what's right. In a way, it's very much like Banneker is concluding by giving Thomas Jefferson the benefit of the doubt, right? You know, although he might be guilty, he knows what's right and he knows he can do what's right. So giving him the benefit of the doubt, that's an important part of, you know, Banneker achieving his goal here. It's almost as if he's encouraging him. Now, back to that word wean. Uh, I think it's an important part of this passage. It, it's, it's like a baby dependent on her mother to exist. You, that is Jefferson, drink from the cup of slavery to exist and to have power. View things from the perspective of a slave. View things from the same perspective you had when under British rule. And stop drinking the sinful drink. Stop getting drunk, right? That's, that's a sin. Stop getting drunk on power. Do God's work and help and slavery. 
So here I'm just, what am I doing? I'm just going crazy when it comes to that word wean. I'm expanding upon it. In a way, he has a metaphor, right? That metaphor, which is wean to drink. And I am just kind of extending that metaphor. And I could do that in my essay in order to show, wow, I know exactly what he's implying here. Now, some other things to point out here, right? So we've got this allusion here, which is to the founding documents of our nation. And we've got this allusion here to Job, which is a biblical allusion. So I wrote down here, he's alluding to the founding documents of the United States, right? So that's a patriotic or nationalistic appeal. And he's alluding to the Bible. So this is a religious appeal or maybe even like a moral appeal here. And that's something that I can also easily include in my essay. Forgive me, you're probably gonna hear my wife in the background. She's doing her stuff, I'm doing my stuff. All right, so your notes might be really different than mine, and that's completely fine. You might have focused on some of the same things, you might have focused on different things. It doesn't matter, just as long as you're interacting with that text and coming up with some items for analysis, some items for explication. Okay, so I'm going to go over a few more things uh, that I kind of, you know, after reading the whole thing, I'm like, all right, what else? Or what are the devices that I, or strategies that I am going to focus on primarily in my essay? Remember, we, we want for a rhetorical analysis essay to have three body paragraphs. We want our th thesis statement to kind of focus on three specific strategies, uh, one strategy for each body paragraph. So. In that case, we need to try to choose the ones that are the most substantial, the ones that give us the most invitation for analysis. And yeah, sure, we could talk about some other things. Let's say, for example, we, we notice that there is parallel structure, or we notice that there is a compound complex sentence, or we notice that there is, you know, anaphora. I don't know if there is any here. Or we notice that there is antithesis. But do we have enough to write about that for a full paragraph? Maybe not. That doesn't mean we have to ignore it. That just means, you know, we might mention it in passing within the structure of a larger paragraph that is focusing on a more substantial device or strategy. So let's go over some more of the strategies and some more of my annotations, you know, towards the bottom of that, that blank space where I tried to cram it full. And if you don't have as many notes as me, that's okay. I, I'm confessing here, full disclosure, okay? I, I, I did my annotations, I took kind of my time with that because I wanted to point out as much as possible for you. So I'm not expecting for you to have as much as me, but you wanna have a goal where you're trying to have as much as me. So one of the most substantial strategies, I'd say, goes back to the beginning of the passage, which is the analogy comparison or juxtaposition, right? Where he uses British colonial rule over the United States as an example. Hey, that's exemplification, right? Example of unjust control. He's paralleling the experience of the founding fathers when it came to British colonial rule to slaves. Okay, that's key here. So hopefully it's like, look, we can, we, we've got a shared experience. I've got this at the top. We've got shared experience. Uh, we've got common ground. Now, what, what about that word, sir? Like, what am I gonna do about that? Am I going to have a full body paragraph that's about the word, sir? Maybe, because it's kind of key when it comes to this passage. So it establishes this, first of all, very formal, but also very respectful tone. In fact, I tried to describe it as disarmingly respectful. In other words, Jefferson reads this, and first of all, it's well-written, so you know, talk about credibility right there, talk about Jefferson's desire to want to hear this person out. The fact that a son of former slaves is just so educated uh, in this way that that's going to grab Jefferson's attention, okay? But the fact that he is, even if he's been or his brothers have been through all of the atrocities of slavery, he is still nevertheless respectful. And he has every right to not be, if you think about it, right? Look, man, you you write these beautiful words, these ideals that we should all be living up to, and you have people that are enslaved, right? In bondage, 
So wh why would he be respectful? Well, if he wants Jefferson to really hear him out, he better be here. Okay, yeah, sure, this definitely has some parallels to Letter from Birmingham Jail by Dr. King. I hope you're realizing that. Okay, so we've got Sir, a uh, formal, respectful diction, disarmingly respectful, and he makes the reader, makes TJ, more willing to hear him out. It's a modest tone throughout the passage, yet at the same time, simultaneously, he's critical. So he manages to balance these tones, and if, and if you want to get into perhaps the tonal shifts, you know, the subtle tonal shifts, or how he balances these two tones of modest and respectful, but also critical, then absolutely you could do that. Okay, and just a few more final notes that I have down here. He's paralleling the, paralleling the struggle of U.S. independence, as we said before, with the struggle for freedom when it comes to slavery, right? And he's indirectly pointing out the hypocrisy. At least in the beginning, he's indirectly pointing out the hypocrisy, but later on, you can argue that he's, he's directly pointing it out. Again, though, still maintaining respect and still giving Thomas Jefferson the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, so those are my annotations, and it's a lot, but when I annotate like this, I basically, I have the backbone of my essay. And, you know, do I expect for you to fill up a sheet this much? No, absolutely not. It's just about you grappling onto anything that you could find and being, being able to expand upon it in the actual essay. But if you can do this, then absolutely, that's great. Now... What other devices did you come up? Do you have, do you have anything that I don't have? Uh, you know, as a recap, let's go over some of the ones that I came up with. First of all, uh, we've got the analogy or comparison or juxtaposition. We've got tone uh, when it comes to the modest yet critical tone. We've got this uh, metaphor that we, in, a, in effect, can extend uh, and you know, explain really thorough, thoroughly there. We've got allusions. We've got the biblical allusions. We've got the his historical or the founding document, allusions to founding documents. We've got the concept of heaven and God and the religiosity that is present in this passage. And in general, we've got these antithetical concepts or diction that is antithetical, uh, especially in that paragraph around lines 30, between lines uh, 28 to 40-ish, right? And let's not forget, you know, sir, okay? So keep that stuff in mind. Uh, eventually, we have to s decide what are we going to do with regards to our thesis? What will be the devices or strategies that we're going to focus on in our thesis and obviously as a result in the essay itself? So now is the part where you kind of have to sit back and just kind of plot out the essay. What will my thesis be? What devices or strategies will I focus on in each body paragraph? Remember, uh, when it comes to the thesis statement, I've given you multiple strategies or models that you could follow. First of all, there's the rhetorical precis. So you could use that, or you could use a variation of the rhetorical precis. I've also given you the structure that starts with the sentence through, right? Through, blank, blank, and blank. Uh, Benjamin Banneker argues against slavery or, or whatever. I, I'm not too crazy about that. I would say something along the lines of through blank, blank, and blank. Ban Banneker compels Jefferson blank. And in that blank, I would use the word slavery or against slavery. Something along those lines. It doesn't have to be exact. And sometimes if you, if you can't concisely mention a specific device, in other words, by trying to fit it into one of those three blanks, blank, blank, and blank, your sentence just becomes way too wordy or too long, then take it easy, right? You could, you could mention in that main part of your thesis two devices and then throw in another sentence after that that also mentions the device, right? This is, is, this is writing, this is English, nothing is really set in stone here about how you could do it or you should do it. It's just about doing it well and doing it in a way that makes your reader understand, wow, you know, A, this person knows what's up when it comes to this passage and rhetorical strategies, and B, this person writes well. So we're going to be, you know, 
coming to a close soon. Not yet, but soon. And it, it, this is the time where you're going to kind of gather your notes, right? You have to keep in mind that everything that we did today, as unrealistic as this seems, this is a long, what I did was I broke down the process of how we kind of just delve, dive straight into a passage, annotate the living heck out of it, uh, analyze the living heck out of it, so that we have enough material for an actual analytical essay. So we now, you now need to kind of gather your thoughts and figure out, okay, this is what my essay will be. And then it's like, it's writing time, right? Everything that we did here on the day of the test, you're condensing into around 10 minutes. As crazy as that sounds, you can't do it. You're not going to do it with such level of detail. Please understand that I, I did all this just to make it easier for you to understand some of the devices that we have, some of the strategies that we have at our disposal for our essay. But in your mind, you're doing it with that level of detail. Your notes, not as much. You want to have some things, but in your mind, it's there. So you're, gonna, you're gonna, going to sit down, collect your thoughts, organize your thoughts, organize your notes, and then kind of plot, plot out the essay. And then it's like, let's write this thing, all right? I'm going to expect for you to write it, handwrite it. And that is going to be something that you're going to want to time, right? The AP exam, the, the, the college board says that you have 40 minutes to get this task done. And that's tough. And, you know, frankly, I, I had so many exercises planned for us when it comes to writing with a purpose and writing quickly. And I could still do those with you probably remotely. But, you know, it's a, it's a very intense type of in the zone, flow state type of writing where your pen never stops moving. And you kind of want to try that out when you're doing this. You're, you're, it's hasty writing. So you, you know, you're just pushing yourself and pushing yourself and pushing yourself. By the time you're done writing this essay, you know, you, you, your, your fingers will hurt. You've got to shake them out, right? I see students doing that, shaking their fingers out. So you, you're going to have to do that too. And that's how we kind of get through it. We even have to consider, look, I, I have to leave myself time to proofread. So 40 minutes, if I say go ahead and take 40 minutes right now to write the essay, or take 40 minutes tonight, or take 40 minutes tomorrow morning to write the essay, know that if you take the full 40 minutes, you're actually putting yourself at a, at a disadvantage because that 40 minutes that you took to write the essay should have also encompassed the annotating the planning, right? And you want to keep that in mind as we're going through these exercises. At this point, this time, probably not next time, the 40 minutes, it's going to be everything straight through. This and that. And we have to kind of set ourselves these little goals. Let's first see if when you have the essay planned, when you have the passage annotated, you can do the essay in 40 minutes, which you can. You just got to push yourself. So much of this is about pushing yourself and you could all do it. Uh, so if you could do it in 40 minutes, then we kind of restrict ourselves even more. Then we say, okay, next time I'm going to see if I could do all this and the writing in 45 minutes. Then we restrict ourselves even more to see if we could do all this and the writing and the proofreading in 40 minutes. I have a few more things to say, and then we'll be kind of coming to a close. So I moved upstairs where it's a little bit more quiet. All right, so as this lesson comes to a close, first of all, I thought that you, I, I hope that you found this helpful with regards to tackling a rhetorical analysis passage. If you think about it, this was our first true attempt at, you know, we've had all sorts of regions prep, but 
in a way, this was our first look at a uh, an actual AP language and composition rhetorical analysis passage. I've been giving you those skills all year, and you've got them, and you just kind of have to trust yourself when it comes to that. Again, don't sweat the devices so much, uh, or the, the names of the devices. If you can, that's great, right? It, but you don't have to call it antithesis. You just have to explain. Look at these contrasting concepts and delve into the meaning of those contrasts. Uh, explore the implications of those contrasting words or concepts, right? All right, uh, so you'll be writing this essay and you're going to have to submit it to me and I want you to handwrite it and how are you gonna submit it to me? I'm not sure, I'll figure it out, right? You know, that might mean you're going to write your essay and somehow convert it to a PDF. And if you don't know how to do that, I could help you do that. And then submit it to me through Google uh, ha uh, Classroom. Uh, but, you know, I did a YouTube video for my first lesson. Am I going to continue to do these YouTube videos moving forward? I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I really feel like we need to interact in some way. So whether that means we're going to be doing Zoom or Google Meet, Hangouts, Meet, whatever you call it, we, we will probably incorporate that into our instruction sometime soon. Uh, but I'm still working on that. You know, the other thing is that uh, what about these full practice exams? We're going to have to figure that out too, because one of the most important parts of getting my students ready over the years for the AP exams has been getting them to sit down, whether that's on a Friday night, right, after school, or whether that's a Saturday morning, or whether that's over an April break, right? We were, we were sitting down and going through a test, and we did that multiple times. So by the time that that test rolled around, students felt, look, I've done this before, I'm ready. But let's also look at the bigger picture here, because this is not so much about the test as it is the educational experience, the development of, of critical thinking skills, the, the learning of the learning about how one uses language in order to achieve a specific purpose. If we think about this passage, it's brilliant. Right? It's, re it's really, it's, it's a masterful work. And not only is it worth analyzing for a test, this is just an important document to read. I mean, this guy, Benjamin Banneker, son of former slaves, look at what he was, a farmer, a astronomer, a mathematician, a surveyor. This is at a time when his own people, his brothers, his sisters were enslaved. He was able to accomplish all of this. It's remarkable. It's inspirational, if you ask me. So, you know, there are bigger pictures here, right? And, I mean, I just want, I just want to research this guy, Benjamin Bannock. I want to see what he looked like. I want to learn more about him. All right, so let's kind of just uh, shift gears here and talk about, you know, other stuff. I'm going to try over the next week or so to figure out a way to make myself as available as possible. I need to have some sort of office hours. I, I want to say, okay, at this chunk of time during the day, I will be doing nothing but waiting to hear from students who have questions about anything. Uh, they'll kind of be my virtual office hours and you'll contact me somehow and we'll talk, right? Uh, that we might do that through through video conferencing. We could do that through Remind, I guess. But, you know, it might just be better to have us, uh, have me sitting in front of a computer and waiting for students to kind of pop in. I'll give you a, a, a Hangouts Meet join code and you could pop in if you have any questions. Uh, what else? Unfortunately, you know, from this point on, I'm going to be giving you work, but if the goal is for you to score as high on this test as possible, like let's get that five because I know some of you can get that five. I know some of you can get that four. I know a whole bunch of you are at least going to get a three. I would bet money that if you took it today, you'd manage to get a three. But, you know, if your goal is to really do well on this test, which it should be your goal, right? Then 
you're going to have to do more on your own. I will not be assigning everything in cliffs. But you want to set yourself a goal where you feel like you've done more than what I've assigned in cliffs. I'm not going to sign everything from that new review book. There will be, there will be large portions of the textbook that we don't get to, but like, why not? Some of the stuff in that textbook is really good. So go through it. Find a short passage and read it and, and just, you know, think about the questions that the textbook asks you. Think through the answers. All of that helps. Now, I also want to just talk about just what we're going through right now because nobody's been through anything like this. And again, we have to remain as flexible as possible. We have to be as motivated as possible. But the other thing is, you know, being confined to our houses like this. First of all, safety is the most important thing. Our health is the most important thing. Our friends, our families are the most important thing. So please be safe. Take care of yourselves. Take care of your loved ones. Take care of your family members. Look out for them. Part of taking care of yourself is just setting yourself these, like, routines. You want to consider, what would I do if this, if we weren't going through all of this? And in a way, you want to try to replicate that to the best of your ability. So set yourself some routines. The other thing is, you know, I can't, uh, I can't stress this enough. Stay home. Avoid public places. Avoid public gatherings. We, we, that, that's the top priority. And you need to make sure that the same goes for everyone that you live with. We have to stay home. But then with that, you know, we get this cabin fever and, and then we find ourselves in front of screens constantly. And, and that that that's not too good either. I mean, just to give you an example, I was uh, I, I spent this morning with my uh, director and my colleagues in this video chat. And then, you know, we tried out video chatting ourselves and I was sitting in front of a computer screen and here I am sitting in front of my phone and later on I'm gonna be trying to upload this to YouTube and then you're going to be texting me or contacting me. And then it's just like, yo, screen time, holy cow. We have to, we have to break away from that and just allow ourselves to be, you know, to do something that does not require a screen in front of us. I, I for one, I, ha I haven't been out of my house in two days. Well, excuse me, I gotta figure out what this beeping is. I think I was saying that I haven't been out of my house in like two days, but I'm still trying to, I still, I'm still waking up kind of early and, and, and I'm jumping in the shower and you know, I'm, I'm making sure that I'm doing some exercise and I'm, and I'm getting down and doing work. So I, I recommend that you do the same. I need to get out though, uh, you know, and taking a walk is fine, right? I need to do that, but I'm staying away from people. If anyone's walking that I can see, I'm 10 feet away from them, have to be, right? We wanna be aware of the air that we're breathing. So we're gonna get through this together okay life isn't stopping school isn't stopping going to school that's on pause for now but I'm gonna continue teaching you're gonna continue learning and one way or the other by the time the school year is over we're all gonna feel like look every time I get a notification or a call or something like that it interrupts the video what was i saying i think i was saying that i'm going to keep teaching you're going to keep learning and by the time the school year is over we're going to feel like one way or the other we we learned we progressed i just i i need to thank you right now already even though we're just starting this you're all hard workers and you all care and uh, that means a lot to me, and I mean it when I say I'm lucky to have you as students, okay? 
So I hope you found this helpful. I don't know if I'm going to continue to do these YouTube videos. I might. Most of my students know about YouTube and they're comfortable with it, so it might work. Maybe I'll do that for my primary mode of instruction, but I need the interaction too. So we're gonna figure this out, okay? Zoom looks good. I still gotta try it out. I tried out the Hangouts Meet thing. That works too. And you know, we'll see, all right? Take care, take care of yourselves, take care of your loved ones, stay out of public places, stay out of public gatherings. Peace.